Hello, Eddie. Nice to see you again. Lovely to see you, Paul. I'm just loving our, what we call chinwags, um, just because it's such a new medium and for us to get together. And I know you, you yourself are quite a fan of this, to see these long form podcasts where people try and deal with really difficult questions and difficult concepts. And, and we're going to try and un unpack a tiny bit. Uh, a real amazing book out we here and we're kind of responding a little bit to um, a conversation that Jordan Peterson had with Ian McGilchrist and we'll make sure we put the link into the full podcast so people can enjoy that because it was a wonderful dialogue wasn't it Eddie? Yes yes it, it, indeed it was indeed it was. Mm. And, I, and, and what comes to mind to start things off because we're basically talking about I think Eddie has the book there is we're talking about this book yeah. The Master and his emissary. And yours is a different cover to mine. Mine's, you got the first edition. Yeah, this is, um, I think, 2010, something like that. 2010, I right. I remember seeing it in the magazine, reviewed in the magazine years ago, and I thought, that sounds good. <laughs> so I got it, and uh, I read it, and because it's quite a weighty book, um, yeah. I remember reading it in two parts because, um, well, it's, it's mind-blowing you could say so i had to put yes. my mind back together after reading the first part so i can manage the second part so yeah because he is essentially asking you to see something again that you've seen ten thousand times but from from a different architecture of thinking altogether isn't it hmm. essentially in a way uh, and and i think you can probably see this is i'm a bit like this with nietzsche's beyond good and evil i don't know why i turn the pages because i end up turning all the pages <laughs> Yeah. So if we can see, it's just every page is <laughs> so really it, it, I failed miserably there. <laughs> it looks like you've been devouring it, sir. I have, and it comes from you. You mentioned it, I don't know, four or five years ago in a discussion, oh, you should read the McGilchrist. And I watched a few YouTube videos and and I was astonished at the way he spoke about it. Because he's scientific, but also his richness of literature. And there's been, a, I think he's a, a psychiatrist as well. And he's, what you find in the book is, it, 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 for maybe people who are, in, who are maybe scientific empirically, he unpacks all these injuries in certain parts of the hemisphere, doesn't he? Which is really, I find really fascinating because it kind of uh, substantiates some of the, the discussions, really, when you see what can't be attended to when there is a, a breakdown in one hemisphere. Uh, which I find really interesting. So, so the quote that comes to mind, and I think it's one that um, that comes to your mind as well, is when he said that uh, the quality of the world that comes to our attention is dependent upon the quality of the attention that we bring to it. Mm. Yeah. And then the other thing I'd like to add is the quote that is reportedly uh, said by Einstein, mm. who played the violin a lot. Uh, as well uh, and he said the intuitive mind the right side is the sacred grit and the rational mind is the faithful servant mm. yet we follow the servant and have forgot the gift mm. and so that's my little sort of introduction a bit Eddie to it and maybe you could say a few things about some of the notes you made and we can just stress how an, an important book this is a life-changing book what is it John Cleese says? It's the, it's the best book ever written. <laughs> <laughs> he's not being funny there for once. So. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not, is he? He's absolutely astonished at McGilchrist's skill to trace back the way that we could be seeing things only in the left hemisphere, which is very mechanical and likes order and mm -hmm. things in rows and lines. And I like that story when he says about the bird, doesn't he? When he says that the bird's looking at the seed and the left hemisphere saying something like, oh, oh, there's the seed. And the right hemisphere is going, will I get eaten? <laughs> it can see more of the, of the whole. Yeah. The, mm. the, the left hemisphere of the brain focuses on the detail, whereas the right hemisphere um, enmeshes itself in life. You know, um, and there's, there's a lovely mm. quote I found from the book. Um, which is really lovely. Um, only the right hemisphere can direct attention to what comes to us from the edges of our awareness. 
Very beautiful. So getting back to what, what you, what did, so you said about initially about what went the, the, the quotes I said are about, about, yeah, about the second bit, the, about the attention and the intuitive mind yeah absolutely and i think as um as creative people ourselves um we are using whether we're aware of it or not we're using the right hemisphere more uh to do the thing that we create you can see your painting behind you and we're kind of as me as an improviser i'm not i'm playing one note after the other which is very mechanistic you know play a c play a g play an e but when I improvise my improvised concerts, I are coming with a preconceived idea about what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I um, just begin and trust the intuitive mind will help me. Yes. There, there is a field of awareness of the mechanistic things like learning scales and things, but then that isn't even in my field of awareness when I'm, when I'm playing music. And, and that's mm. the same with me when I'm painting. So okay. You know, I know that um, certain colours, if I mix one colour with another colour, um, I can create a third colour. Um, and then different colours mix different shades um, and also lighter and darker areas, different tones within that too. So, you know, th there is, um, uh, shall we say the little... The little parts of everything. I don't want to use mechanical terms here. I'm I'm, I'm 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 searching through my mind as I'm speaking to find beautiful metaphoric words rather than yes. mechanical words that are so often used for these things. So I'm not components mm. and things like that. I, I I'm going to say okay. Um, little bits of of uh, grass blades is 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 you know if i put them all together all these little grass blades blades of grass then it will create this field of vision that i'm i'm having mm. and that that becomes the whole so uh, you know the the right the basic the the premise of the, the right and the left brain that the hemispheres of the of mm. the right and the left is the right is does as you say sees the whole of, of everything it sees the whole picture in a sense and the left is it it, it, it dives down and sees a little little parts of it little blades of grass each blade of the grass and it thinks well that's this this that that or we can put this into a into its box into its that's that goes into that category this goes into that category but it cannot create that full picture which is what the right um part of the brain does and the problem that Ian McGilchrist is you know absolutely passionate about this is why he's written the master and his emissary and his new book that's coming out is that he thinks the left hemisphere the one that likes to reduce things down to its little parts is becoming the dominant part of our culture and thus the the right hemisphere is suffering because of this and then we are suffering because of this because we cannot see or perceive the deepness of life because the left one is putting these little compartments in front of us and stopping that happening mm. and it is it's causing a deteriorate deterioration of our access uh, into this world of soul this world of being this world of being fully alive it's reducing it down to these little things unemotional little things and emotion mm. as you will know being a creative as well and a deep thinker emotion is not some sort of flaky thing at all it's not flaky mm. it, it's, a, it's an essential um it's an essential root of our lives it's a it's a living root into the earth of our lives see i didn't yeah. use mechanistic terms there. <laughs> well you did well then i had written down you know words tell us a story but they also take us away from the story yeah um um 
and I think that's what you alluded to there. You know, when you're a kid and you see, you'll, you'll have done this, and you see clouds, don't you? And then you imagine that you've seen some kind of animal in that cloud, and then you see that animal in the cloud. You're not fooled. You don't believe you've just seen a rabbit. And my concern is that the left hemisphere is fooled. And we've built like an, what I might call, I'm using a, a posh word, but e an epistemic commons that we then use as some kind of reality. Baudrillard, the great philosopher, would call that simulacra. Mm -hmm. It becomes tr the truth. It is the bearer of the truth. But actually, it's not at all, but it's just become the new standard of the truth. And nobody else is allowed to step out from that and say, I, I can see something anew for the first time. Mm. And um, I, I think what you said was was really beautiful, and it, and and it is a concern that we have become so left sided dominant. And I think it's worth when you were speaking. What came up was Noam Chomsky, the the great uh, thinker, who said that most people don't know that they don't know, and they don't know that they don't know. <laughs> so, so what McGiltrice is trying to say is you don't know, and so it's outside your container of experience. So when people are talking about the news and things, he's, in a way, I could use mechanistic terms, he's, tra he's talking about a meta theory, he's saying, don't paradigm that, I like Arsenal, no, I like Tottenham, he's saying, watch football, he's saying, exit the domain and try and view your thinking from a different, a different way of thinking about it, from a different place, which is, which is what stu you know, students do it when they do a PhD, but only do they do it when they do a PhD, possibly, meta theory, where they use the, and we, you mean you talked about this a few days ago, the Hegel dialectic, the, the thesis, antithesis, you know. I love jazz. No, I hate jazz. And you pick your worst enemy against your thinking and see, and you see if you can unpack it. But even then I'm getting to what I'm saying now is still mechanistic. You know, what McGilchrist is saying is something that can't be said with words, isn't it? Like the Zen Buddhist who says, you know, if I'm to speak the truth, I'm, I'm to remain silent. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, difficult to speak to. <laughs> I, I think, um, yeah, words are limiting. Language is limiting. And uh, it's interesting to really learn about that and to, <laughs> funnily enough to read more about that and to see that. So I think that's why we have to be very creative with the use of words. And I think uh, uh, McGilchrist loves poetry. You know, I think um, that was literature was that's what his initial foray into education was and he taught yeah. it, but, uh, um, but poetry and I think we might have alluded to this before in previous discussions is not something that tells you how something definitely is but it entices you and encourages you to look at something or think about something it, it sort of entices you in and then you can have your vision of whatever the poetry, the poem is about. So what it does, it engages, it, um, it fuels, it, it um, stokes the fire of your creative imagination. And from that, you can access these worlds you can perceive things differently this is why it unlocks this door in your mind your heart your soul whatever everything really mm -hmm. and it encourages you to go into this and to see it as though you have not seen it before because we often and this is a left brain thing, we often categorize things. And so we forget to actually see it. And then we just think, you know, a tree is a tree, a, a stone is a stone, a river is a river, but they're unique individual living, breathing, dancing, moving things, you know? So mm. when you actually look at this, you go, my goodness, I've not seen that before. Th this is unique. This is, this is stunningly beautiful. This is, I moved. I, I want to participate in this life I see before me. And 
things like poetry, music, uh, art, uh, dance, movement, whatever, they enable us to be able to do that. And that, on the whole, is, is what might be termed a right hemisphere way of perceiving the world. Uh, what do you think on, on that? How... Beautiful. I, I think what you just said, and I, I like this phrase, that the artist takes you outside the category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, the, the artist just takes you outside of that. What did Picasso say? Something like, all art lies, but it points to the truth. Yeah. <laughs> also, he spent his entire life trying to paint like a child. That's what he said. Yeah. You know, so, which is wonderful. Why would he say that? Because a, a child um, sees the world, not in a naive way, but in, a, in a primal way. Mm-hmm. A primal way. I think... I've got a little quote um, that oh, yeah. says about a child somewhere in, in the thousands of, of notes I've made. Um, Beautiful. <laughs> but, but I know that he, he mentions um, about the child. I'll just find it. The problem is <laughs> he says so, so many amazing things. Um, but I think it's something about the child to the age of four um sees a world like that you know it's more right hemisphere I, th- I think it was up to the age of four a child it's, the right hemisphere dominates entirely so they, they, they perceive the world in this beautiful way of everything for them you know it's all fresh it's new they're, mm. they're, not, uh, they're not used to it they're not used to seeing it so they don't com- become complacent about it and i know and mcgill chris uses that word doesn't he gestalt the german word for this yeah. and there isn't an english word for that is there really and mm. i i know that because we've talked about this before um about what happens to a child when the child starts to go to school starts to read in a sense starts to be taught um goes through the education system and then we're forever, in a sense, within this education system, and and, and that can be part cultural as well. So, and and I know you, I know this is yeah. really important to you because I know for mm. instance, you, you homeschool mm. Miles, your child, and things like that. So, I mean, do you, that could link in? You, uh, absolutely. I, I think, I think you know, trying to just teach one path of wisdom which i'm not even sure if it if it is wisdom really um yes i am i am a rebel in this area i believe we knew we need um a new kind of education system because the education system is just the left hemisphere um and and it's just about it's not autodidactic it's not about cultivating an epiphany so that you can see something yourself for the for the first time you know it's not about that at all it's about passing a test and then forgetting the things that you possibly learn. And I could speak to this a, a long time, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, when I say something like you'd become a piece of human commodity the minute you, you go to school and then you have a value in, in our society it might sound a little edgy, but you know, you're then passing tests and then you're, you're, you're then it become egoic. You're then pitched against another student and you have to do better than them and you have to score more grades. And, and these things, of course, are just something that we invented. They're a constraint of the mind that says, I've got grade eight pianos. As my piano, when I said that to my piano teacher, he said, I've got grade 32. <laughs> you know, he was saying, you know, and then he, he finished that with, you're still at the bottom of Everest looking up. But to some children now, because that is the, they have reached the echelons of the heights of, the, of uh, musical skills. And I am, what I'm suggesting is that, that, that we don't actually, actually cultivate any great sort of, I don't even think we teach one sort of epistemic way of thinking at school. I don't think we teach what we would call sense making. The book I've been writing for, I've been, and I'm sort of on the second draft, so I don't want to jinx it by saying I've written a book, but. I've been working on this book is the idea of saying that I really wish in school, at least, I mean, I think we need a new form of schooling. Um, 
is that we need kind of what you would call meta theory. We need to be able, need to, be able to think about our thinking. And I think we need to cultivate that in young people because what I'm really saying is very positive. I believe that the human mind is capable of such vastness that we don't know about. But unfortunately, it gets veiled of itself with the adults that believe this is what these young people need to know. And the only thing that is true is impermanence is a fundamental fact of existence, both the universe and us. And if we could cultivate the capacity to do, and I'm getting mechanistic again, but to, to do creativity, we could say, which is not mechanistic, but meta moves to view something from a, a different architecture of thinking. Subjects become objects, things that move are still, you know, to constantly change the way we see something so that our perspective is often shifting so that we can see something anew. As John Peterson says beautifully for the first time, like you've just alluded to, Piaget, the great child development psychologist, said that, like you said, between up to four, kids don't see a cat and a dog. And I think John Peterson mentions this, doesn't he? He says they just see a furry thing. Yeah. It's us that mechanistically divide that thing up into a category. And then I think the, then are we ontologically fooled by that? Well, it's not even ontological, it's not even that. I think the only thing that's ontological is consciousness. That's the only primer. But I, I think, are we fooled then down the line? And are we forever being misled by our initial thinking? Hmm. I don't know. What do you, what's your thoughts responding to some of that? Yeah, it's really well said. Very good. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, I, I, are we fooled by our thinking? Yes, of course we are. Mm. Of course we are. I mean... <laughs> Um, but also it, it leads us to incredible places and it depends what, when we say our thinking, do we mean a cultural thinking? Do we mean an individual mm -hmm. thinking, um, an educational way of thinking uh, or being shall we say is this more a way of being too and thinking so yeah i like to question myself a lot on how i think and feel about things because i know that i in a sense have made mistakes do make mistakes and will make mistakes but those mistakes are part of of my learning of how to be so uh, in them <laughs> is 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 a, is, a, is a knowledge it's an experience and you don't always know something is a mistake till afterwards in a sense and then many strangely enough many years later what we might perceive then as a mistake might have great knowledge in it that we remember and there might be something that we've forgotten where we think, oh, I'll just cast this aside. So it's a very complicated thing. And this is why my, my explanation of it is slightly muddled because it's a very hard one to put mm -hmm. work out. So my right brain is the only thing I can use in this to explain, not my left, because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to. So no, it's, um, do I think education is wrong it's very hard to say to answer yes to that mm. because it, we can't just have wrong or right there are many shades between as well um do i personally think um the school education helped me i would say a very minimal amount do i think that education helps a lot of people to really perceive and understand the world, I would say a very minimal amount. Again, I would, I would definitely say that. I think, I think there's a lot of goodness in it. I do, but I think it misses a hell of a lot. It mm. really does. And it does not um, give much importance to the creativity that a, a human being has in abundance that is suppressed that is seen as a secondary or even you know 
it, it's seen as almost pointless sometimes, which angers me, absolutely irritates me, <laughs> and makes me want to, I don't know, smash things on the floor in a sense. It, 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 you know, it, it creates a, 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 an upsurge of anger inside me because I, I, I'm seeing what we're depriving ourselves of. And I think McGill, Chris, has a very similar <laughs> opinion in a way of reading his book mm -hmm. and also of his many um, and quite varied interviews and discussions that he's done. And he has a real passion. And I don't know if you noticed, but in the, the Jordan Peterson interview, which was recent, his body actions were incredible. I've never seen him so wound up in a way because he's, he's quite, um, you, you could say he's quite a, a gentle um, look to him, feel to him and, you know, sort of almost like pipe and slippers type of look in a way. Um, you know, he's, he's very intelligent, but he does it in a very nice way. But in that interview, he was quite strong and he, he was leaning in like this into the screen, he was tapping down everything. He was getting quite animated. Now, he's talking to Jordan Peterson, who is a brilliant person, but, but he, he often interrupts and he often is quite strong on his, um, well, he, he, he'll talk for a longer time on a question, which is brilliant, but sometimes it, you get a bit lost in, in what it is. So I think in a sense, You've got, you've got this sort of almost like an intellectual boxing match going on between them. And, and McGilchrist really went for it, not, not in a negative way, but to, um, to really emphasise his point. But his emotion that was coming through when he was getting roused about these passionate ideas that he spent all his whole life going through, you could see. So I like that. The guy's really intelligent. He knows a lot of stuff, and yet this passion is surging out of him. And you can see it in the physical side there too. I really, really mm. love that. Um, what, what do you think of that? Do you think... Yeah, well, I mean, you said so many great things there we could unpack. It was just it was really lovely, Eddie. But, um, yeah, <laughs> I think he certainly did bring – he was very passionate about it. He, he also wouldn't let John, you know, interrupt him, which was really – which was really lovely. But just going back to a couple of points you made, um, which I think were just really, really important, you know, like, like we said, uh, we alluded to earlier, you know, I, Einstein played the violin and a lot of his great thinking happened when he was in that imaginal world. You know, he loved to play Mozart. David Bowen, another great, powerful person who lived next door to him for a time, would often go around, you know, <laughs> and uh, he'd, be, he'd be playing his violin. You know, and he imagines, you have to imagine something first before you can prove if it's right or wrong. Uh, it has to live in the imaginal world. It might be hard for people when I say this, but we live in somebody else's imagination of what reality is. This is a creative imaginary, which we might call capitalism or whatever we want to call it, this guy, guys. But it's an imagination. It could be a different world, couldn't it? We've imagined it, that this is the way we should be. If an alien come down and said, Hey, they pass this paper across that's got some funny images on it. They press no, notes on numbers and it means so much. And it, it doesn't, does it? You know, <laughs> we are living in that. We, this is a creative imaginary. So we could have another creative imaginary that's different. And what I wanted to raise was just the importance of creativity to inform the, to inform the left side of the hemisphere. And I think that's what McGilchrist is really saying. He's not dissing science because he uses so much of that in his book. He's saying, what could a scientist be if they lived in the imaginal realm as well? And the, the two kind of informed the other in a kind of dialectic way. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's not even just living. It's, it's acknowledging it, isn't it? it? It's just an acknowledgement mm. of saying, yes, this is very important to it. So if you acknowledge that, then you are living in it. And you, they are living in it. They just need to acknowledge it. You know, and I think we, we all we need to acknowledge that in a sense, don't we? All of us, I, I do, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, there's something that comes to mind, so to interrupt, is the Keith Jarrett quote where he says, music doesn't 
come from music. He says, it's like saying babies come from babies. He says, it's not what happens. He says, music's a result of a process that's nothing to do with music. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think about that in, with, the, with, with, science, with the empirical science and things, the idea that actually that really does inform the creative side really is uh, essential. And in fact, there's a school near here, and I won't say the name, but they have a big arts department because they know that, and actually that school has very high results. Okay, we could put that on site because I'm not so keen about that. But what it shows is the fact that they have dance and singing and mu they all have music lessons every week. It means that they have, the creativity is alongside that and it's seen in their results. I mean, uh, we could unpack that, but I think that's really fascinating. And the imaginal realm is just like, it's the, it, it lights the torch, you know. It, it is everything. Yeah, I, I, I think... I think on that point, the creative point there, it's not just about being creative and creating something, a produce, shall we say, like a painting, or a dance, a piece of music. Mm. But through that, it, it's a sense of self-inspiring and also inspiring others. And so what you do with that as well, you build yourself up. Okay, you give yourself mm. um, more self confidence. Um, you you have to work problems out by being creative. That's what being creative is. You have to work out how do I do this. Yeah, you know how how do I get to that from where mm. I am now? So that is problem solving. Um, and you, you, you can't just use your mind in, in the sense of just a simple way of thinking through it. You, you have to trial and error. So you have to have experiences. And by having experiences trying to produce something, that builds your character up, doesn't it? It builds you yourself up. You've experienced yes. something that didn't go right, say. What do you do? Do you give in? Or, or do you think, right, I'll just change it. I'll just come back a little, you know, so you go that way and it doesn't work. You just sort of come around and you go that way and it, and it works. So you, you're forever sort of moving, you know, it's not a straight line. It, it, it's a spiral sometimes to get there. So what you're having to do, you're, you're having to forecast into the future in a sense of where you're going to go when you hit some sort of blockade. You have to work your way over it, through it, and try. And then going through that, you understand what happens in that. But you understand about yourself, and you develop mm. yourself. And, and it connects you deeply with other people as well, even if you're just doing something on your own. Because you learn so much and you connect deeply with life. And so you perceive and understand things with such a broader mind and a bigger heart and a larger <laughs> soul. It, it, Beautiful. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, um, you do. You, yeah, you, you create yourself as you create, don't you? Hmm. Yeah, and, you know, whatever religion people may be attracted to you know we we um we should create in this creation <laughs> it's like giving back we are we are here on this spinning ball and i think it's our job to create something within this creation yeah. like give it the ultimate give it giving back you know yeah and and, and and the sense of the sacred is within the creativity which is where all these mm. sacred wonders i mean you think about the I mean, I think about the art, thousands upon thousands of years of artwork, which we can still see and experience. Mm. Mm. So, yes, absolutely incredible. So I'd I just like to get back to oh. the Jordan Peterson thing. I know we, mm. I love having these dialogues because we'll have something and we pick up a point and we need to go into there and then we need to come back. Mm. Um, I love that. But the, what did you think on that on that sort of dyna, dynamism between the two when they were discussing and what, what were the thoughts perhaps do you have and things that you took from that? 
Right, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, like you say, I, I think one of the things, because John Peterson's amazing and it's just wonderful that he's back after he was so well. And his thinking's getting sharper and sharper and sharper, you know. And I haven't read his new book, but I read the, the last one, you know, The Twelve Rules for Life. And it's wonderful. He, he, he weaves great thinking in from Piaget, the great child development psychologist, to, to Nietzsche, you know. And he has some really beautiful ways of putting something across that could be understood. Uh, you know, I, I said to you before, I, I kind of, I think he's, he's kind of like a, for certain people who maybe don't have that, with their family, although they love their family, he's like a father figure that maybe didn't have this kind of titan intellectually. Uh, and there's people who don't know John Peterson, and I'm sure there's people who don't. Is these, these epic biblical le lectures he's done, you know, the discussions about Piaget, the great child development psychologist. These are just fascinating, and I I, I, I know what you're saying, and I I think there is I'm trying to grasp the words that are right. I think he. He's not quite understanding exactly where McGilchrist is coming from. I think McGilchrist quite found it a bit tricky maybe to unpack with John Peterson about the divine and the sacred. And so I'm really interested to hear this last chapter of his book, which I think is called The Sacred or, or something along, along that lines. But a very, very powerful conversation. And I, find it, I found it very thought-provoking. But as for the dynamic, yeah, I think McGilchrist was the um, strongest I've ever seen him. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But that's great, isn't it? That um, an intellectual conversation like that. I mean, we seem we seem to think of intellectual conversations as being perhaps in a way abstract, almost dry, you could say. But that's far from the truth. Um, these are great discussions, great dialogues. Where you know you might have people with very opposing um, viewpoints, but what what you do in a dialogue you don't just give your argument and then the other person gives their argument you give their own and you don't really listen to the other person what a great dialogue is is about listening to someone with different viewpoints and understanding from their viewpoint and then that can help you see not only their viewpoint stronger but your viewpoint stronger mm. and you can then develop it as well. And then you can help the other person develop it too by listening. Cause that other person might say something and they might say something, think, do I really believe that? Or was I just saying that then? Cause I was opposed to someone mm. it was like, you, you know, was it like almost like a reaction in a way? So a, a great dialogue is essential. And there are many that are happening actually. Now we've got this medium, and, and that's what happened with the, the Peterson, the Gilchrist one there too. Um, very interesting uh, personalities, very very different personalities too. I mean, we're, we're talking about the right and the left brain, so the right, uh, sorry, the right and the left hemispheres of the brain. So in a sense, I, I saw them, I think I mentioned this to you before, but I, so remember the right hemisphere is, shall we say the more the creative, the whole, whereas the left hemisphere is, is looks more at the particulars and the details. So I saw them both um, standing in the centre and they both had one leg on the central line. And I saw McGilchrist with one of his legs in the right side and then, mm. then one of his legs on, on the left side. Just, they were just, just in, you know what I mean? So they weren't at the ex extreme, shall we say. Um, I, I, and that, because when I watch these dialogues or listen i visualize things as well and and that helps me to perceive what they're actually dialoguing about so i, I got that because because peterson was being mm. in a way slightly analytical trying to ex understand exactly what this is he wants to sort of pin it down doesn't he and you know uh, 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 he wants to pin down the butterfly and put it in his collector's box whereas McGill mcgillchrist wants to let the butterfly go in a way, yes. So, yeah, re wonderful dynamic um, in that one too. So, so, what, is there anything else we could? I mean, there's so much to unpack in that book, isn't there? <laughs> you know. Yeah, the use of images when he shows you, you know, the certain illusion pictures where you have to look and see what you can see. And now, I don't want to spoil that because people should look at that for the first time and see how the brain is hungry to see something, but something else is 
plainly in view, but you don't attend to it. It's like we said at the start, you know, your attention, and this is what McGill Chris keeps coming back, it, it shapes our reality. You know, if I, if I think about my wife and say my wife means the world to me, but then if that's, you know, I'm not going to go, I like her right eye and then her ear's nice and her hair there's nice. Then I've become kind of left hemisphere mechanistic, haven't I? <laughs> She means the world to me. You can't put something into to words. And yeah. I think they mentioned the, the painter who paints haystacks, don't they? Money. Money. At different times of seasons, is it, Eddie? I think. Mm. Yeah, so you get different light coming in as well. So it's the same picture shown at different times. So the light changes, so you get a different effect. But it's exactly the same view. And it shows that the different forms of, of perceptions you know um it, it, it's going in a linear time shall we say it's this time it's done then it's done then so and he also did that with um, um i can't remember which cathedral i'm sure he did it with a cathedral as well right um, okay so, so yeah, yeah brilliant i mean art <laughs> art is um giving answers again well it's not giving answers art is showing different perceptions of the world, mm. how we can perceive the world in different ways. So it's opening up our, our, mm. our mind, like I've just previously said, to to seeing things and experiencing things differently. I mean, yeah, for the first started, time. Yeah, exactly. And as we started, mm. it's the attention, you know, about the, I love that bit about what Michael Chris says about the attention. It's the attention you, um, you, you you attend, look at the world, and it's the attention you bring to it as well. But also that 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 will then feed back into you, too. That will, yeah. attention will, will feed back into you. So you, you know it, it's 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 an ongoing process. It's wonderful. So mm. I find that yeah, I mean you raise so many interesting points. So like you said about dialogues and things, and the way that they are listening to each other and. What was it? Bertrand Russell said, I'm not going to die for my beliefs because I might be wrong, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I try and use that thing like, and some people call it rule amiga, where you give people the benefit of the doubt. So even when you're having a conversation and you're hearing what I might call a lot of noise and not much signal, you give them the benefit of the doubt that there'd be something from your perspective that you're missing. And so by listening them speak more, you're listening maybe not necessarily to what's being said, but what they're trying to express. And you can ask more questions until what they've expressed has kind of hit you and you understand it more. And then that helps your perception of it. So you've got to be careful that you just, and unfortunately our media narrative is unacceptable. You know, we know from ancient tribes that if I'd stole your orange, we'd have a long debate about it. And it, it, it would last a long time. And it wouldn't be over with a four-minute soundbite. And this is what is wonderful about this medium, that we can have a question about this kind of topic. Okay, this book's big, but, you know, we can, we can talk about it a little bit. And some of these podcasts are three hours, and they unpack this so beautifully. So this is a very new medium, and I feel very blessed that me and you can have this dialogue. Like I said, I just want to put it up there, leave it there. My son can look at it when he's old and see this is where, this is where my dad was thinking about things and this is where he is now or he's not here now and i think it's it's so important but we need to learn what john viveki calls dialogus you know listening to each other trying to learn from each other being aware to change what we've seen because this is really tiny what we started at the talk about our attention being able to have our attention shifted at any point and suddenly change our perspective like like that you know I, I i didn't i don't eat meat for example and i don't because somebody shift my perspective on it and i was really gnarly about it until my perspective shifted and then there's people who do eat meat but i made a change and at first it was uncomfortable for somebody to tell me that to say well you can't love animals if you've got a dog and you you know and and that, that you and you eat them for example i mean that's one thing i'm just bringing up but i'm saying that suddenly my perspective was or my beliefs were put in to doubt and I had to confront them and I decided to do something different about that. And it's important that that person who gave that to me, gave that to me in love and compassion, you know, in good faith. And I took it, I didn't go hmm, like that. 
and suddenly suppress it. I listened and I took on board what they were saying. And it might be a few weeks afterwards that something sinks in. But unfortunately, the narrative of our, well, me and you are big media watchers, so we can't really speak much about that. But, <laughs> but that, that's not acceptable, these kind of short form things, which have got so much bias and things. And, and so I think podcasts are such a, a wonderful thing. Sorry, I've said a lot there. But. Oh, no, you should. no, please say it as much as you mm. need, because I, I think um, it's very important to try and, that's what a dialogue is, important to try and get that point across, and it's, it, it's, which is very hard. Um, and yeah. if you try and do it in a very short time, as you say, we're a mainstream media thing. It, 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 it can't, it can't get it across. I mean, it, it's, you know, we, we automatically judge, don't we? So we, it, there's all these sayings, judge, don't judge by appearances, and, you know, and, and overreaction. And there's all these things. And I, I think it's very easy to quickly go into a reaction and to quickly judge, um, to not listen to a viewpoint that isn't yours, to, um, yeah, I think it's so, so easy to do that because when you do that, it's uncomfortable. It can be uncomfortable mm. if, you, if, if you don't, you know, judge quickly in that because what you're doing then, you're actually looking and you, you've got yourself in a sort of comfy zone of who you are, you know who you are, you know what you're doing. And if you start to see something outside of that and start to um, try and understand it, um, give your attention to it, you get uncomfortable because yeah. it's challenging the paradigm of, of your life. It's challenging what you have put yourself within. And yet, when you realize that uncomfortable feeling is actually self-knowledge and uh, deep knowledge and attention of the world <laughs> that this is you know when the right hemisphere sort of says oh mm. look at this you need to look mm. the ven then you go oh, wow and you, you and you sort of have to rebuild parts of your life but actually the building process of it is beautiful it's like creating mm. a painting you know yeah, it's, mm. not a, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So yeah, I think that's beautiful, and I, I think it's um, you know there's that lovely. The, he tells a story in the book, doesn't he? The Chinese farmer story. You know, like I suppose what he's trying to say is, I'll tell the story in a second. But he's trying to say that things we do things are so impermanent but we we sort of told that life's a journey with a beginning and a middle and an end and actually you know that time is an abstraction the only time is now as we've seen what's happened over the last few years and people have not been with their friends and all those kind of things and these are really you know south things we love being together you know and but but you know back going back to him barfield he said that um i don't know should be one of the highest virtues hmm. Um, but we mechanistically want an end game, to quote Marvel. You know, we want, a, we want something to have an end. But what McGilchrist is saying is, we don't know. And I love this idea, sorry, I'm slightly, but I love this idea that he said if he was in government, he would have an invert department, which would do the opposite of any choice that the government made. Mm -hmm. Because he believes the left hemisphere is hungry for something that's not good. By, its, by the evolution of consciousness. It's gone a certain way. So his choices, it's not good at making choices because as Chomsky says, he doesn't know that he doesn't know. But the Chinese story is, it, I don't, do you remember it? No, do you tell. The, the, yeah, the farmer. So the Chinese farmer's got a horse and then one day the horse goes missing and everybody in the village goes, that's bad news. And he goes, maybe, maybe not. And the next day, the horse comes back with another horse. They all go, hey, that's good news. <laughs> and he says, maybe, maybe not. The day after that, his son goes out on the horse, comes back, he's broke his leg. And they all go, that's bad news. And he says, maybe, maybe not. The day after that, the conscription officers come to take his son away to war. He can't go because he's broke his leg. Everybody in the village says, that's good news. And he says, maybe, 
maybe not. <laughs> and I remember little Christie's trying to say that, you know, this impermanence and that we don't, the mechanistic left hemisphere tries to line all these things up in order. And actually, if we just sat back and, and just were more in touch with this intuitive mind, then the way we attend to reality could be different. And I, I mean, he's really hinting, Eddie, isn't it? That, um, I guess it sounds harsh to end our conversation around this, but he's saying that we simply can't be this human being anymore. Mm. Yeah. We, that, that's what he's saying. He says we're self... I mean, Daniel Smachenberger, who says things honestly, <laughs> says that we're, we're inexorably self-terminating. And we will be the destruction of the planet if we carry on being the way that we are. And that means you have to attend to it and see something again for the first time. Mm. You know. But I do believe if we can cultivate an epiphany in the right side hemisphere, I do believe the human mind is capable of so much more. And we can see that in these exceptional, you know, Nietzsche one in a billion mind, for example, or whatever. We can see these cases, but I think there'll be much more of them if we could just let young people cultivate the creativity, the imaginal world. And that would inform both sides. So, well, the left hemisphere more, but would make the world a richer and more beautiful lived experience. It, it's not a case mm. of finding the wild animal in the wild. It's a case of letting it out of the cage, isn't it? Because we put it there. Yeah, we veil ourselves of ourselves. The powerful Barfield phrase is, I, you know, he says it, doesn't he? I don't believe the mind exists in the brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what we would say to everybody is that we've scratched the surface. It's, it's a must read. If you are all inquisitive about the state of our society, and the way that we attend to things and see things, such as the media and politicians and, and all those kind of things. Um, McGill is in an astonishing mind. And this new book, what's it called, Eddie? The new one he's written? It's going to be out soon. The Matter with Things, I think it is. I think it's yeah. October. Uh, when it comes October, right. So, look, people, if you haven't already, you need to read this before you then read that. Because it's taken him a long time, and apparently this book's longer than the Bible. So I'm going to need a lot of lie-downs after I've... Uh, after I've read a few sentences. <laughs> you, need, you need lots of cups of tea and I'll need lots of coffee. Um, Absolutely. To, to, mm. um, to plough through it. But yeah, I, um, yeah, I also... Yeah, was there any closing thoughts that you'd like to bring up, Eddie, you know? Look, I mean, I also encourage people to read it. Um, I also encourage people to be creative because you, they are creative. People are creative already. So... A really simple thing is is not to feel that not to feel judged don't feel judged and just be creative and play play is i think is key and essential just play in whatever medium you want to do just play and then as you play then you can start to consider it and attend to developing skills with that but initially play because what's happened through education all sorts of things with the, the left hemisphere it's clamped us down so we need to psychologically get rid of that clamp by play first and foremost and then learn the skills of of the creative medium you love uh, that's what i would say i think that's a beautiful note to end a conversation that could be a conversation of a conversation and go on and on and on that was wonderful lovely to talk to you about this that was that was a fantastic um chat paul brilliant and uh, mm. i encourage people to to um have a look at our other dialogues and also um check out the links that we'll put uh, below on seeing more of mcgill christ and the jordan uh, jordan peterson and mcgill christ um dialogue I really recommend it so um yeah absolutely great all right. Well, lovely, Eddie. I'll see you for the next gym work. Definitely. All right. See you again soon, Eddie. Lovely to see you. Bye for now. Bye-bye.